I've been reared to go down to the well for a bucket of water, bring it up, fill the black pot, hang it on the crook, heat it, use it, put it in the galvanised bath to wash myself. My baking is done on the hearth fire. I bake my own bread in my pot ovens. Perhaps it is long drawn out, but it's all I've ever known. I'm almost 50 years old and I've always lived here and my father before me. It, the house was bought by my grandfather over 100 years ago and uh, it's always been owned by our family. It's a, a three apartment cottage, a kitchen and two bedrooms. Historians describe it as a representation of vernacular architecture, but I just describe it as home. When visitors come, uh, they see it as a museum. I don't like that. I don't think it's a museum. I wouldn't like it seen as a museum. Everything in it is used. Everything you see in this cottage today that people would class as museum pieces, I use because I need them. They're all I've got. So I do not see it as a museum. I see it as my home with my things that I use every day and that my father and grandfather have used before me. no desire to have television, but I do love reading books. I especially like the Russian authors because they're very graphic in their details. It's a great interest to visitors how I manage, how I cope, but uh, to me it's uh, with no difficulty at all because the fire is so important. It heats the water. I. Um, use the fire for uh, heating the little heater that forms as an iron. Uh, cooking, I do my baking in the pot ovens over the hearth fire. So everything really is dependent on the fire. And also the um, strength of the cottage, the length it lasts is dictated by the fire. The timbers are so old that a good fire is necessary to keep a house like this living. There was four people in the family altogether, my parents, my sister and myself. My mother was a much younger woman, but unfortunately she died from meningitis when she was 49. This was a very sad time for us. She died in 1952. My sister is two years older than me. Her name is Frida and she lives in England now. She's married there with a 14-year-old boy. My sister left because someone had to earn money. She was very bright, she got a good job in the civil service. Every penny that she earned, she sent home. And uh, I spent the money that she sent home. Uh, we, there was times we couldn't have carried on had it not been for my sister. I felt that I had to go away from here once my education was complete. A lot of money and time had been spent on me. And I thought, now's the time to start earning some money and um, paying it back. and. Um, you know, I'd had my chance and, and now was the time to go and do some work. That's how I felt when I left here. I left primary school at 14. Primary school was just a walk across the fields. And uh, I spent uh, my school days looking out through the window, looking over at my own house and wondering what my father was doing and what he'd have for my tea when I would come home. He always had something ready for me. And when I left school and came here, I just looked after the cows and the piece of land, which didn't take up a lot of time. But unfortunately, he was getting uh, 
stiffer he, he had a severe form of rheumatism and uh, I always remember him walking on one stick but then he progressed to two sticks but he never complained he had a lot of pain but uh, we never heard him complaining he wasn't a complainer my father uh, was confined to bed for the last 17 years of his life he was in his 94th year Obviously, I knew that so, at some stage he would die, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't think he would die that young. I thought he would go on and on for quite a few years, but he just didn't. It was it was a great loss, but he had left us so much that we had something to cling to. At the time I was looking after my father, I couldn't have a job because it was a full-time job, first of all, with the small piece of land, and then when he was confined to bed, I had to spend my time uh, looking after him. And I didn't really think uh, at that time that I would get a job because I wasn't exactly a spring chicken, and work wasn't that plentiful in the area. But. Uh, a development group had uh, started up in Belcou and they had approached ACE, Action for Community Employment, and got some ACE placements. And uh, I applied for a job with Belcou Development Group and I was very lucky to get my first job at uh, the age of 46. While I was delighted to get the job, it was uh, quite um, worrying before I went to work, wondering how I would adapt to a work society. Uh, I wondered about uh, the electrical things there, the photocopier and um, the kettle, things that I had never seen and uh, certainly knew that I wouldn't know how to use them and wouldn't have any burning amb ambition to learn how to use them. But uh, I had a lovely boss called Caroline and she was quite sympathetic, knew my background and uh, eased me gently into the situation. My first job was a research officer with the development group and that meant I had a research history in the area and I mean this was just a continuation of what I had done with my father here. The knowledge I have at the moment of the area all developed from listening to my father talking to people. What was here, what a giant's grave was and ghost stories and folklore and tradition, all the things that matters. Everything that mattered he talked about and I inherited his love of that and I'm thankful that I did. When I'd come to study of some particular topic, say a Garden Hill House, I didn't have to go to public records office to research it. I had to go to my own file, things that my father had told me that I had all here. Having uh, left school uh, at an early age and no secondary education, uh, it was my own lack of knowledge that worried me. But uh, the only thing I came armed with was my love of the area and my knowledge of the area. I knew that nobody could put me down on that. I knew they weren't going to get any better for the heritage of the area and having been born and bred the third generation in that area. And uh, that gave me great courage. And I'll tell you, I needed courage at that point in time. Because entering the work world at 46 isn't an easy task. It certainly isn't easy when uh, you're not educated. My first allocation of work was researching the area and seeing where heritage nature trails could be devised. And the development group have 40 square mile in their study area, so I went out walking over that entire area to see where the potential was for having little walks. And uh, so far we have devised five of these. And they're very interesting, all completely different all within the group's area and uh, each seeped in its own particular tradition, folklore and areas of history. If you're walking you see the area, you come to uh, get more familiar with the area. 
people talk about history, they see it as buildings, they forget about the natural history, the actual spring whales, the um, rare types of birds. We've got the hen harrier nesting in this area. We still got the corn creek. We've got uh, varied species that one wouldn't have. For instance, um, in the flora, we have uh, a rare white heather found in Cornicully. The only other place that you would find this rare white heather is in the Basque region of Spain and in Cornwall. So we're pleased having something like that. We also have quite a lot of limestone land and uh, this tends to create magnesium deposits. This is quite rare. Also, the limestone land tends to have a lot of spring whales with curing properties. So we're again just lucky in what we have in the area. We have 40 square mile in our study area and the five trails cover this entire area. And I think the uh, unusual aspect about the trails is each one of them is so different. On the Garden Hill Trail, which is on the road where I live, we have an old house called Garden Hill House. It belonged to the Hazard family. Uh, Jason Hazard was High Sheriff of County Fermanagh in 1676. Heading more northwest, we have the Latoon Trail and that takes in a lot of mountain region, heading away out to Knockmower to visit a cave. So all the different trails have some different aspect. The Belcou Trail is a cross-border trail encompassing Black Lion and County Cavan. And it features a, a very important site called the Crom Cruig. Crom Cruig was the National King Idol of Ireland, a, a pagan site that a, Sacrificial rites were carried out here. The Crom Cruig was offered the firstborn of family and stock. And if you examine this standing stone closely, you will see groves in it which allowed the blood to run freely down the stone. It originally was located in Southern Ireland, but as Christianity came across the border much earlier than it came here, it was moved to this place for safekeeping. Prior to the birth of Belcou, which came along with the railway, uh, the most uh, famous town in County Fermanagh was called Holy Well. It derived its name from the Holy Well located there. This is a very famous pool of water, again with curative properties. It is reputed to have the cure of paralytic disorders and uh, is, was founded by St. Senel but in the annals of long ago, it's recorded as it was founded by St. Patrick. Yes. Now, children, I'm going on down to the whale, and I'll talk to you from here, and then I'll bring you in to see the whale. Um, Holy Whale, as well as featuring the actual Holy Whale, also had a fair and very important part of Irish history. It had a market cross, it had a medieval church, and it had a bull on stone. The water flows both ways. That's very good indeed. As you can see, it's a pool of clear spring water, supposedly issuing 23,000 gallons of water per hour, which is a vast amount of water. The purity of this water has been regaled by thousands of people who came here seeking cures. It contains curative properties, and it's reputed to cure nervous or paralytic disorders. With a fair day, it meant a lot of to-ing and fro-ing. People came from very far away uh, to this fair to bring with them their ass loads of potting and uh, other spirits. And uh, they sold their wares at this particular place. And then went to the she beans and got drunk. And then went into the holy well for a little dip. The church clamped down on the religious pilgrimages carried out here due to all the drunkenness and debauchery that occurred as a result of the Holy Well being so closely located to the she beans. Now, while this is called Mullicovet Mill, in earlier days it was called Cleggan Mills because the town land in which this is located borders on the town land of Cleggan. 
Again, like a lot of other sites in our area, there is no exact dating for this. It's assumed it was built in the late 1700s by the Earl of Ern. I had a particular interest in it because I had heard my father talk of coming here to have corn milled. So I set about finding out who the actual owner was. And when I told him of our plans, he was very pleased and agreed to give us the mill on a 99-year lease. The actual mill and drying house will be restored. The next plan is the building of an interpretive centre, the museum, which will house dairy and artefacts, the outhouses and the old Molly Covet shop, which was a very important part of history many years ago. All the neighbouring houses sheltered by Belmore Mountains came here to do their shopping, so the shop will be restored. Phase three is the heat development and the caravan park. So when Belcoo and District Development Group have Mully Covet Mill in place, it certainly will put Belcoo on the tourist map. You just pick some place nice there to stand. I feel children should be made aware of history at a very early age and I think the best way to do that is through the primary schools and occasionally we are asked by our local primary school and other primary schools to take children out on archaeological tours and this shows especially local children what's in their own area. Now children, if you'd like to look to your right and you'll see the leper window. This is a very rare type of window and it was devised so that people suffering from leprosy could come and partake of the church service without being observed by the present congregation. The stonework is reasonably secure at the moment, but uh, plans are at the investigative study stage. The wealth of historic sites that we have here, and we're always very proud to do this, and we accommodate any school that wants us to take them out on a trip, we accommodate them. I especially like giving tours to children, school children, because I find that they are unaware that their parents would have all developed from a place like this, not only their parents but their ancestors. And they don't understand it. They think this is a museum piece, where it isn't. Their family came from places like this and uh, I think children should be made aware of how the Irish long ago lived and how some of us still live today. This is the metal pot oven, and like the black pot for boiling the water, it's a very necessary commodity in a house like this. It's used for cooking the dinner and for baking. Baking in this pot oven is a very simple exercise. It just means when the bread is ready, hang the pot oven there on the crook over the coals, and place some coals on the lid. This means that the heat is evenly distributed and the bread is full of flavour with a soft crust, not like the bread you would buy. Very tasty and very fresh. I like an open door. We've always had an open door and I will always show the cottage to whoever wants to see it. Be that school children, boy scouts, doesn't matter what group or what individual comes, I would have an open door. I'd be very proud of that. Irrespective of who they are or what they are, I will show them the cottage. I believe that's what life is all about. These are the two types of iron I use. The simple smoothing iron, which is very easy to operate, and the box iron. The smoothing iron is just placed directly in front of the fire, and it gets enough heat from the fire to do ironing. But this one is a bit more awkward. The heater has to be taken from this and placed in the centre of the fire and some coals put round it. And after about 30 minutes or so, 
it's ready for ironing. And it's this box iron that I would use most of the time. Kaelian was always a very important part of our lifestyle. It was traditional and uh, in my father's time it was always carried on here. We had loads of Kaelians coming in. Younger people tend to come in more now than older people. Uh, and I'm especially pleased to see children uh, carrying on traditions like that because it's so important that children should be made aware of their culture and of traditions. something that uh, my father was so proud of and, and I'm pleased that it's still carried on here. The village of Belcou had its origins in the middle of the last century. It came about by way of the construction of the Sligo, Leitrim and Northern Counties Railways, which was set up as part of a famine relief scheme. It gave people jobs during the famine period. When stone houses were built in Belcou for workers, the people who were living in the then town of Holywell came down to live in Belcou. Belcou is a population of around 400 people. We've always had a major unemployment problem. A lot of young people had to leave the area to find work. We actually lost a complete generation between the mid-70s into the 80s because of unemployment. We knew something had to be done to reverse this trend. So in 1987, some members of Belcou Community Association formed Belcou and District Development Group in an attempt to bring jobs to the area. One of the founder members of Belcou Development Group was Jim Sheridan. He spearheaded plans for the building of an enterprise centre. This project cost £400,000 and has now become a reality. Most of the work on this enterprise centre was carried out by workers under an Action for Community Employment Scheme. By using ACE, it meant we were able to employ our own local people. Um, if we had to bring in an outside contractor, he would have brought in his own workforce. Uh, and it would be very doubtful if many local people would have got an opportunity. It meant extra pay packets going into the households in the area, so it gave more encouragement to the local people to really get behind the project. Again, it goes back to the people of the area, and they were very supportive of us. We had a major draw some years ago, and that was supported by people of Belcou, and in that draw alone, £30,000 was raised. So Belcou people, in fact, put in £30,000 themselves to the initiation of the development programme for the Enterprise Centre. The Enterprise Centre has nine craft units and people wishing to start their old businesses can rent a unit here and um, there's also a coffee shop and a home bakery. We're quite close to the Marble Arch Caves where uh, at the moment people would have to wait up to two hours when they come on a coach load and we were hoping to take that coach load to Belcou and they could spend them a couple of hours with us and go back up to the caves. Ladies and gentlemen, you're very welcome to the autumn launch of the Belcou and District Historical Society. Early in October 1988, I sent out letters to people I assumed evinced an interest in local history. I sent out 12 letters and 25 people turned up to our first meeting. Tonight, we are especially pleased to have as our guest speaker, Alf McCreary. So I would ask you to give him a round of applause. It just went from strength to strength and today we have a cross-border, cross-community membership of 110 people. Thank you, Margaret, very much indeed. Um, I was here some years ago, as you know, writing my book 
Ulster journey. And somewhere around Fermanagh, I heard about this young lady who lived, lives in a beautiful cottage on the hillside and who loves literature uh, and knows about literature. So I found Margaret Gallagher, not on the hillside, but on a cottage. Uh, and I remember we had a marvellous interview, it lasted for about two or three hours. It rains from Chekhov to Cabra. In 1991, I was promoted to project manager with Belcoo and District Development Group, and one of the requirements of that post was that I should have a car to be able to visit outlying projects and attend meetings. A car does not interest me. I wouldn't know one end of a car from another, and my brother-in-law came home to buy me the car. I had learned to drive back in the... Um, 70s. My father, funny enough, was insisting that I learn to drive. He kept saying, you have to look out for yourself when I'm gone and if you get a job, you'll need a car. And again, it was his wisdom. There is nothing in the modern world I would want. My dearest wish would be that my family who live in England would come and live in Northern Ireland and I can see signs of that already. That would be my dearest wish because I think there is nothing in the world as powerful as the love of a family. I'd love to come back to Ireland to live. Um, in fact, uh, my husband and I do plan to come to Ireland when we retire. Um, I don't mean to come back and live um, as Margaret lives. I don't mean that. I, I've been living with modern things too long now to give them up. So um, I'd like to come back and live in Ireland in a modern house, somewhere near Margaret, maybe. <laughs> um, she has her lifestyle and I have mine, and they are completely different. My sister has one child, Kieran, and he will inherit this place. I would like to think I would end my days here with nothing changed. It is going to be progressively difficult as I get older to keep the roof repaired and all that, but I hope I'll be able to hold it until Kieran is old enough to come and... Uh, I wouldn't expect him to live here permanently, but I would like to think he would settle in Northern Ireland and have this as his house where he would look after it and uh, I know the way he's reared that he will do that. But uh, for the remainder of my lifetime, I hopefully will live here. Please God, I would like to end my days here exactly as the house is now, complete with my hanging table, my flag floor, my pieces that I have gathered over the years that has been here. That's how I would like to see myself. I would like to be carried out in a coffin from this house because this is home.